You're listening to Mom and Doc Talk, where we talk all things healing pans and pandas with an emphasis on homeopathy. Hi, and welcome to Mom and Doc Talk. Jody and I are so excited to have the guests that we have today. We have been looking forward to this conversation for literally months, and um, I'm just not even going to mess around. I'm just going to go ahead and introduce you to Beth Allison Maloney, uh, JD. She rose to national prominence with the publication of her first book, a memoir, Saving Sammy, Curing the Boy Who Caught OCD. Her appearance on the Today Show with her fully recovered son, Sammy, on the date of publication brought nationwide attention to the fact that a simple strep infection can trigger mental illness. It was shortly after publication of her second book, Childhood Interrupted, The Complete Guide to Pandas and Pans, that parents began contacting her for help with medical kidnapping cases where state child protection services sought to have really sick kids taken from parents and placed into government's custody. In 2022, her third book, Protecting Your Child from the Child Protection Service, Child Protection System, was uh, published. It breaks down the system in plain English and devotes an entire section to issues affecting medically complex children. Due to her unique ability to understand both the medical and legal aspects of these cases, her expertise is in national demand. She consults frequently with parents across the country, helping them navigate their way around the pitfalls and through the maze. A number of high-profile cases with which she has been associated have been the focus of exposés in the press. As the mother of a medically complex child, Ms. Maloney has zero tolerance for doctors who try to weaponize the child protection system against parents to meet their own needs. In addition to network television, Ms. Maloney has appeared on cable, radio, and online programs and podcasts. She has spoken at conferences in the United States, Canada, and Europe. Most recently, she spoke at the American Bar Association's 2024 Conference on Children and the Law. Attorney Maloney and her books can be easily found through her website, BethAllisonMaloney.com. And we'll put links to all of that and all of the books in our show notes. Uh, Beth, we are so thrilled to have you joining us because of all of the things that we just shared in your uh, bio, just like the importance that you have in the Pans Pandas community. We are honored that of all of your speaking and engagements that you've had, that you were willing to make time to speak to us and our community. Um, and as I was telling you before we got started, uh, I here at Resilience Naturopathic, I use your books as a way to introduce the the lived experience to our providers who are newer to the world of pans and pandas. Uh, so every single one of my docs here on the team has uh, copies of both of your first two books. And we'll see, we might add the third one. I we, Jody and I just recently read that too. And I have to say, it was eye opening. It was it really, um, and it was so uh, believe it or not, like, this is a funny thing to me. Like we read all the books of anybody who um, comes onto our podcast. And in spite of the fact that it was um, the most outside of my realm of expertise, I enjoyed it more than many of the books that are within my realm of expertise. Um, because I just think it was so important. Well, thank you. Thank you so much for having me here. I, I'm very, I'm delighted. And after that introduction, I hope I don't disappoint you. <laughs> You're good. We are, I, we already love you. I, I feel like with oh, medical providers that actually are willing to help our children, I think you're in the same realm too. Anybody that's willing to hop on board with us and especially someone with that lived experience and being willing to share your time and your knowledge and, and writing books, which is a very difficult thing to do. Um, so we, we, we're already impressed. So yeah. Thank you. You're just here to chat. <laughs> so many in our community are very familiar with your story, but for those who are new to this, can you, can you tell us a bit about yourself and how pandas showed up in your life? So I'm a lawyer and my child who had just turned 12 years old and he was, I don't want to say normal because, you know, every child is different, but didn't have any signs of any kind of difficulty, did great in school, everything was going along, terrific things. He was a happy kid. And all of a sudden, within a period of four to six weeks, he became dysfunctional. He literally could not leave my home. And for a year, I tried to find answers to what was wrong as he kept getting sicker and sicker and sicker. And doctors who we would see would uh, 
just tell me there must be something in the family. Maybe people don't talk about it. And since I am an attorney, I like things to go from point A to point B. There should be a reason that things happen. Not like, oh, it happened. Other than, of course, a car accident. But I wanted to know why he was sick. I could not find any answers. The reason I found out that the entire cause was a strep infection is because my mother happened to work with someone where this had happened to her child. And once I had that information and was then able to get him the appropriate treatment, um, instead of just dumping more and more psych drugs into his system, but addressing the infection and also the relief of finally having an answer, just not for me, but for him to know, okay, there's a reason here. There's an infection in your system that's causing this. And so it took another year for him to be completely healed and he is healed and he is now, he just had a birthday. So he was 1990, so he's 34. He just turned 34. He's totally fine. Awesome. Totally fine. And so about a period after he uh, recovered, there was a period for a couple of years. Of course, it's a close community where I live and everyone was just absolutely stunned that he had done so well. And I happened to be on a walk with a new friend and said to her something about after what we went through with Sammy. And she said, what happened? And when I told her the story, she's, she just was absolutely blown away. So I went back and did some research and I found out that we wouldn't have been any further along five years later than we were when he got sick. I then spent time trying to talk to doctors about it. I went and met with executives and in insurance companies saying, gee, maybe if people looked at infections, you wouldn't be paying for psychiatric hospitalizations. And finally hitting brick wall after brick wall, I thought, you know what? I'm gonna write a book and I'm gonna empower parents with the information and we're gonna build this from the ground floor up. So rather than what I was trying to do was approach it from, I'm gonna educate the doctors, I'm gonna educate the insurance people and then it'll filter down. No, I want parents to have this information. So I wrote the book that I wished someone could have handed me. That was how I wrote that book. And it turned out to make an enormous difference. So I'm very grateful because I know that there are literally thousands of children mm -hmm. who have not had to suffer the way he did. Mm -hmm. And those two years were hellish. Sometimes when I look at that book, I don't know how we made it through, but I'm grateful that it was only two years because mm -hmm. some children have suffered much longer. Yes, absolutely. You know, I have to say, I, I love that you share that it was only because of the connection to somebody who had experienced this. Like that is what we hear so much in this community mm -hmm. that it's only because of people coming back and sharing their stories and sharing their experience that more parents are aware of it, more doctors are aware of it, that we've got, you know, as of, um, by the time this airs, we will, we will, know for sure whether or not the bill here in California has passed to require insurance coverage. Um, so hopefully it will have passed, but watching it very closely, getting some support on board for that. Um, so uh, it's it's like remarkable to me that people keep coming back. And this like leads into my next question for you, which is um, about your professional work, because there's so many people who stick around um, either professionally or just like in that personal capacity where you know, you could set this in your past and just be like, mm -hmm. that was a horrible time in my life and I'm done. Yeah. Um, and yet so many people in the PANS community, Jody's another one of those people that they stick around even when their kids have, have fully recovered. So right. tell us more about that and about your professional work that you do okay. as a mom. So I made a promise to God. Mm -hmm. It's right in the book where I said, I went to a place where I kayak from all the time and I said, God, if this is what he's got, I promise you it's not going to end with my kid gets better and we're done. Mm -hmm. 
So anyone who knows me knows that I keep my promises and that was a promise I made. So I never looked back and it then has become my life mm -hmm. and led me into other uh, related areas. So, so taking my legal skills, of course, I recognized that being a lawyer put me in a really good position to be an advocate. Mm -hmm. I know how to be an advocate. I'm not concerned about being an advocate. Doctors don't scare me. When do when I could tell doctors were telling me something, oh, you're doctors, I don't want to insult you or anything. But, you know, in the book, you can see that I saw certain doctors who were incredibly rude and arrogant, mm -hmm. and not helpful. And I was very comfortable just not going back. So those are all things that are part of my personality that I think enabled me. So anyway, so then what started happening was I was then hearing from parents around the country who were telling me that they were being accused of child abuse because they were trying to find the right help for their kids. And at first, in all honesty, I, I just couldn't believe that that was true because I had done a lot of child protection work. So, so if this was a, you know, a book, this would be like the character arc, right? So here I am thinking, this can't possibly be true. But as time went on, I saw it absolutely is true. Mm -hmm. And so that when parents begin now to tell me that's what is or has happened to them, I start with the assumption that it is true. Mm -hmm. And then, so I did write a, the second book, which is um, Childhood Interrupted, Complete Guide to Pandas and Pants. And I wrote that for parents. I had probably at that point in time when I started that book had more than 50,000 emails and I would be up at night writing these emails. But, and then I thought, well, you know, what if I consolidated all of that information into a book? Because as many emails as I got, and they were all different, but the basic principles were the same. Mm -hmm. And so what I tried to do was pick um, emails that were um, representative of a common problem. And then I would reach out to those parents and say, hey, I want to use your email for a basis. I didn't, there's no direct exact word for word email, but a common question. And then I would answer that question in the chapters. <clears throat> so that's, that's that book. Then what happened was as more and more parents were coming and approaching me, telling me that they were having problems with child protection services, taking their children from them. And then I was doing these cases and winning them because I understand enough. I understand medicine well enough as a result of my experience with Sammy to be able to grasp what doctors are saying, not just in, not just in pandas and pans, but in other areas as well. Mm -hmm. I get the basic premise, right? It's a lot of work sometimes, but I can wrap my head around it. Anyway, so then along comes the pandemic in 2020. And I have, um, you know, like everyone else, I'm isolated. I can't get on an airplane to go visit my children. <laughs> One, one's in LA, two are in Seattle woe is me. And my oldest son tells me he thinks I need a hobby. So I decide I'm going to start sewing masks. There's a hobby. So I get the sew, drag the sewing machine out and I set up the television and I'm think now I just need something to watch while I'm sewing the mask. And I come across something called the Innocence Files. And the Innocence Files is based on the Innocence Project and the Innocence Project gets criminals out of jail because they're innocent. They're innocently convicted person. I don't even want to call them criminals, alleged criminals. So I start watching these episodes. I thought, you know, this is the exact same thing that parents do in my cases. They say the wrong thing, not, not the wrong things. They say the right things, but they misunderstand the system. Mm -hmm. Why don't I write a book about that? So I jumped up and I turned around and I went to my computer and did a Google search, no book on the topic at all, yeah. and started writing that day. And that's where the third book came from, Protecting Your Child from the Child Protection System. And it 
originally the plan was it was all motivated by these medically complex situations but mm -hmm. then as i began to write i realized well i have to actually explain the system mm -hmm. in order for parents who are in this to understand it so it really explains the whole thing <clears throat> and there's a whole section specifically related to medically complex children yeah. so that's how you know medicine and law came to merge into my life fantastic well, and here I, I am talking to you <laughs> <laughs> well I have to stop and have a moment of appreciation because um you know, I, I think the way that the bar is moving on all of this and more people are learning and kids are getting treatment quicker is by the people that are advocating. And you've clearly have been advocating for many, many years and, and teaching on a grander scale. So thank you for all of the work that you've done. And also you caught my attention a second ago when you said something about you weren't afraid of doctors and you weren't, you moved right on. And I was sitting here thinking like now I'm not afraid of doctors at all, but in the beginning I was, I was so intimidated and um, I wish I could have started in that place of not being so intimidated and not feeling like um, that I had to uh, like, do the things and, and go about it. So uh, do you have any advice for moms like me that are just kind of afraid okay. of? Well, here's the secret. Uh -huh. They are afraid of me. That's, That's true. I'm a lawyer. Okay. I did not realize this yeah. until about, I don't know, maybe 10 years ago, but I, I didn't really understand that when I went into a doctor's office and I needed maybe some kind of surgery and I mentioned that I was a lawyer, alarm bells went off, right? So I had an advantage there. Yeah. What, what the book is saying that is, or what I hope it's saying is, I recognize you're not necessarily in that position. And that's not to say that they won't go, these child abuse pediatricians won't go after lawyers. They're just, it's, they're a little more hesitant, right? Yeah. And I really think they'd be hesitant to go after me, but in any event. So what I try to say to parents are, is here are the ways that I think you can safely handle conversations. Here are red flags for you to be aware of. So, when you are asked particular questions, sometimes it it isn't the best um, approach to just lay it all out on the table, mm -hmm. right? And so it's very similar. Everyone knows, for or if everyone I think knows from watching television shows, cable shows, whatever that if you are suspected of a crime and the police bring you in and want to talk to you, maybe talking to them isn't the best idea, yeah. even if you're innocent. And yeah. so it is very much the same kind of a situation where when you know that something is off, maybe sitting down and explaining the whole situation exactly how you see it and letting the doctor know that you actually understand this area of medicine better than they understand it. And here are the 15 doctors that you've seen before. And that's why you're seeing this one. And, you know, you couldn't stand the three doctors. I mean, this is what parents do because they don't understand the dynamics. So I don't know that I can, spe can specifically say don't be afraid of doctors, but you do need to be aware and be smart about it and understand if you're in a tough situation that maybe you need to modify what you're doing and what you're saying. And that's the problem that I see many parents getting getting themselves into. They they are they are afraid. I have people who have emailed me and said, I don't want to go back to see that doctor. What should I tell them? And I just say, we well, just don't go back. Yeah. You don't need to write a whole email explaining why you're not going back. You just, you don't go back. Yep. Well, I have an appointment. Okay, well, call up and cancel the appointment. And when they say, should we make another appointment? Then you say, well, I'll get back to you. You, you don't have to justify not seeing a doctor. 
The problem is that I think parents get so far into the process, they keep going back. Mm -hmm. And because they keep thinking if they explain it better, it'll work out. That, that, pro that process doesn't usually work. Yeah. Yeah. So we're going, we've, we've started to go down the hole of the stuff that we are going to cover with the book, because that's what we want to spend most of our time today is talking about your newest book. It's not that new anymore, but the, the protecting your child. Um, and so, uh, like for instance, you brought up the child abuse pediatricians. We've got a question for you for sure about that. So okay. we can give people context. So I want to back up just a little bit, okay. um, to just talk about a couple of things, um, and like get some clear definitions from you for things for parents, just so they have, if they haven't read the book yet, which, you know, like I said, I've read the book. I have to tell you it is as much as I, I really truly enjoyed it. And I've already recommended your book to a couple of friends who have kids that are, they're going through a contentious divorce and they've got kids who have some special okay. needs and just okay. making it like, you need this book. Um, I have to say it's for you. Everybody should buy it. You should have it as a reference in case you need it. Hopefully you never need it. We're going to hit some high points for you today that hopefully will help get you through like the basics. If you feel like you're at the place when you need it, and then you have it as a resource, but I will say maybe don't take it to soccer games. I took it and I was reading it at a soccer game and I got some funny looks from people, uh, from my kid. I was like, Oh, I promise there's not an issue. That said, there were some really shocking statistics that I read in the book that I just wanted to share with people because I don't have a medically complex complex child yet. Hopefully that stays the case because I likely had pans as a child too. So she's got a higher risk for it. Um, but the, the thing is like, it could happen to anybody, even if they don't have a medically complex child, right? If they've just got an accident that, you know, things could come up. So here were yeah. some, some shocking statistics that I just wanted to share. So 38% of children have been the subject of a child protected investigation. Um, right. That was like shocking to me that more than a third of children um, mm -hmm. have been the subject. And then 53% of black children have been the subject of a child protection investigation. Okay. Um, I, I heard it on another podcast I was listening to today about how like even in schools, bringing things up about concerns for like children of, of color is far more risky because of the fact that the parents are more likely to have a negative outcome from it. And this just speaks to that, um, mm -hmm. that challenge. Um, and that, that people of color are twice as likely to be investigated following a report of abuse because not all, all um, reports are, are follow up with investigation, but people of color are at a clear disadvantage. Um, so both shocking and, and, and disappointing, but not all that surprising statistics. I was shocked. I mean, when I did the research and saw yeah. the numbers, it was it it blew me away. Yeah. Yeah. So I mean, how do you define medical child abuse? Okay. So medical child abuse for me is when you have a medically complex child. So you guys could probably define it better than me, but not a child who has your typical um childhood ailments where you see the pediatrician I don't know maybe I'm trying to remember when my kids were little like maybe six times a year maybe not yeah maybe. even less than that yeah. for most cases like yeah, once I mean, a year. you get your your regular physical every year you take them once a year and then maybe you see them two or three other times not a lot right yeah but when you have a child who has complex medical conditions so pandas pants those are complex. We're talking about, you know, autoimmune reactions and infections that cause behavioral symptoms. This is really complex. Children who have a breathing tube, children who need a feeding tube, any kind of a complex disorder where you would have to see doctors beyond the pediatrician. So these are generally not conditions that a pediatrician treats except for pandas and pans. And what I would say about that generally, because I don't want to forget to make this point, is that parents, in my opinion, are far better off to see a uh, pediatrician, family doctor who will specialize in this, or maybe doesn't even specialize, but treats a lot of children who have this, rather than a academic hospital mm -hmm. for things like maybe 
certain so certainly there are complicated conditions where you got to go to an academic hospital, right? I mean, I don't know, like some kind of Ehlers Danlos syndrome. You probably, I'm thinking, need to go to an academic hospital as opposed to a pediatric practice or a family doctor, or maybe a complicated uh, immunological disorder, but not this, you know, that maybe you need an immunologist for that. But here's the problem with pandas and pants. Am I getting too far off track here? No. Okay. The problem with pandas and pants is that the academic, uh, my son, Sammy, would not have qualified under the very strict criteria that they employ. He didn't get this overnight. You know, they want something like it happens within three days. You know, they've got like a whole list of stuff. Guess what? It didn't happen that way. He's the most famous pandas patient in the world, right? Mm -hmm. It didn't happen to him that way. It happened over a period of four to six weeks. I wrote about it in the book. There was, he. it started because he was walking around with his eyes shut, feeling his way around. And then, different behaviors were added, but he didn't wake up one day as a totally different child. Yeah. So please don't tell me that that's what has to happen. It doesn't always happen that way. Yeah. Even the Stanford findings recently, um, and not even that recently, found that I think it was 60% of people who met the criteria for pans or pandas, um, except for that sudden onset. And so they, they're they they're acknowledging at the Stanford Pans Clinic that um, that it's, the sudden onset might not actually be necessary or even accurate. And you could be missing an awful lot of people who need support in this particular a way, in this particular approach, um, because they're, they're like giving this... Um, arbitrary cutoff. So Stanford is, I think, a lot more ahead of the curve than a lot of other places. Yes. Yeah. I, I will say that. Yeah. Okay. Dr. I'm sure there's, I'm sure there's some, uh, we're probably all thinking about a particular East Coast hospital that has not got some great. Um, I can't think of anyone, any East Coast hospital that is like totally on board and yeah, that's where I'd take my child. No, yeah. none of them. Yeah. But I do think Stanford has Dr. Frankovich. He's more ahead of the curve. My friend, Dr. Angela Tang is working there, helping there. So, I mean, that that's a different place. But generally, for most people in the country, they're going to be better off if you can find a practitioner who has treated, hopefully, a lot of these kids. And if you can't find someone who's treated a lot of these kids, then at least someone who's open to it, mm -hmm. who's willing to try. Yeah who will read the literature, who will talk to other doctors, you're better off because here's why. If you go to a, a hospital, let's say one of my least favorite hospitals, Rady Children's, which I think is near you guys, right? Yep. Very aggressive child abuse pediatrician there, writes all kinds of articles about how Every medically complex child should have a team and she should be sitting on the team and she should be deciding whether the doctor should be uh, rendering the medical care that they think is necessary. Okay, don't go there. This is not helpful. Yeah. Um, so uh, let's just go back. So I want to make sure we really fully have defined what medical child abuse oh, I didn't is tell you. Okay. and then talk about what, what a child abuse pediatrician is too, just so we have some clear definition of that. So, okay. so we, we started with the medically complex children, which I would agree. So it's, it's kids who are on multiple medications, needing multiple specialists, getting lots of referrals, having atypical responses to medications or responses to medications that are different than what is expected or not working when you would expect that it should. Mm -hmm. Um, and, and so I would put that in the realm of medically complex. That's medically complex. Or yeah. you may, and they may just be, for example, a child who has mitochondrial disorder, there mm -hmm. may not be a particular um, medication per se, but there may be different supplements that they need to take in order to maintain their energy level. That's a complex disorder, mitochondrial disorder. So yeah. what happens? Here's, here's how medical child abuse happens. One of those children has, this is generally how it happens, has a crisis, has to go to the emergency room. 
And because the hospitals have these child abuse pediatricians, we'll talk about them in a minute, who have basically driven into the heads of all doctors that parents are to be suspected of being abusers. And so when a mom comes in with a really sick child and starts talking about a complex disorder and probably knows more than the physician in the emergency room who is probably a resident and doesn't have any real lived experience in terms of medicine, let's put it that way. And so that person says, oh, you know, better alert the, the child abuse team at the hospital. And then the next thing you know, you get one of these child abuse pediatricians who comes in and like that, and I mean like that, decides, ah, this, there's nothing wrong with this child. The child is being medically abused by the parent who, by the way, is, you know, 99% of the time, the mother, because they've come up with these, this wacko criteria as to who should be suspected of being a medical child abuser. And 95% of the time, it's a female. Okay, well, by the way, when is the last time that you were in a waiting room for a doctor's office and it was filled with dads with kids? It's generally moms, right? Mm -hmm. Moms are taking care of the kids. Sure, dads are doing it sometimes, but mostly it's mom. And so they go after the mother. And they then accuse the mother of abusing the child. That child doesn't need a breathing tube. That child doesn't need a feeding tube. That child doesn't need, need to be on any kind of supplement. That diagnosis for mitochondrial disease, there's no basis for that. And then they tell their friends at the child protection services who then run in and take custody of the child. And what generally happens is they go to a judge, the kid, so the doctor tells the caseworker, the caseworker goes to a judge, says the doctor is saying that unless they take custody, the child's probably going to die. The judge says, okay, then the caseworker runs, takes custody of mm -hmm. the child. It happens that quickly. Yeah. So you mentioned something about, you know, like the, the things that, you know, these parents coming in and they've got their kids on all these medications or maybe not even on medications, but they're saying like, something's wrong with my kid and they're coming in with tons of research and um, that, you know, as in, especially when I was newer to working with pans and pandas, that's legitimately overwhelming. So I want to validate that that's that that happens. Um, right. And fortunately, I'm not one of those people that like, I, I tend to believe parents when they tell me, um, and I, I have the advantage of being a naturopathic doctor and a homeopath, um, which gives me a different lens to see the world. Um, and then also it didn't hurt that I had my own personal experiences that matched up with a lot of the things that were saying. So it was easier to believe. Um, but it, it can be, especially when you've got so many of these kids can have normal labs too. And, and like be seeing like lots of things happening. And this happens for, you know, adults too. Lots of complex illness can look like normal labs or labs that don't, really make sense. Maybe they're abnormal, but they don't make sense for the way that we're trained. Um, and that starts to set off alarm bells too, right? So if, if they're saying like, this doesn't look right, but they're saying, but your labs say you're fine, that labs do not necessarily tell you what you're seeing in front of you and what the person's experiencing. Right. Yeah. But they also lie about the labs, the doctors yeah. do. Uh, they lie about test results. They lie about what the parents said. It's a very risky place to go to the emergency room, yeah. unless your child uh, broke her leg at a soccer game and there were 15 people who all saw it happen. Yeah. That was and one thing I noted that, that like if, if and it, it's put out like alarm bells up for me because Rady Children's is where I would take my daughter because th that's where we live, um, that if there is something that happens to her that I need to make sure I've got lots of witnesses to whatever happens. Yeah. Um, because yeah. now it extends beyond just so it's become these these child abuse pediatricians have they've become like stormtroopers i don't know how else to describe them so there are only 360 of them in the entire country so i just want to clarify for parents this is not your everyday pediatrician 
This yeah. is a child abuse pediatrician. So yeah. So tell us what that is and how okay. people would interact with them. Okay. So child abuse pediatrician is someone who goes to medical school and then does a residency for two years in pediatrics and then uh, becomes board certified in pediatrics. And then what happens is, as is typical, you can then go and specialize in different fields of mm -hmm. pediatrics. So you could become a pediatric neurosurgeon if you then went on to be trained as a neurosurgeon mm -hmm. or a pediatric rheumatologist or a pediatric whatever. But there is also this training program. Sometimes it's two years, sometimes it's three. I can't really, I, I think it depends on where you go. And they get trained in, excuse me, child abuse. So, and that's part of a longer story of how it happened. So we'll skip that story for now, just trust me. So they go and they get this training and part of their training is how to testify in courtrooms. And they are very much generalists. So, however, even though they are generalists because they are supposedly now going to recognize abuse for a whole host of disorders and diseases, but they don't have any advanced training in any of those they just have this. Mm -hmm. So, so how do they become the experts to decide whether a rheumatologist has it right or not? Mm -hmm. They didn't complete any kind of residency in rheumatology. But so yet their entire role though is to try and find these cases where abuse might happen. One of the things that you shared is that it's it, that it can happen even if somebody's like looking at something in retrospect, like they'll go through and comb through um, recent visits and look for places where maybe they should have been called in and ask for people to like be recalled for stuff. Is that correct? Well, you're, you're, you're jumping six steps ahead because generally they don't look through anything. Okay. They make this decision. You bring your child to the emergency room. Three hours later, you're leaving without your child. They've decided. It doesn't matter if your child has a 10 year history of seeing experts, they decide, no, nope, they all got it wrong. It happens all the time. I don't want to terrify parents, yeah. but it's frightening. They yeah. don't do any kind of research and checking. And then afterwards, after the state of California has custody, I don't know if you're a county based system or state, but after the parent loses custody, which happens very quickly, then there's some kind of a hearing set up at some point. I don't, I'm not trying to be vague. It just depends on what state you live in. Yeah. And during that period of time, now the doctor is maybe looking through records, trying to find something that supports the accusation. I think that's what you're talking about. Well, I was talking about the story you shared in the book about the little girl who went in with a broken leg and then like was called two or three days later, like went home with their right. child, was right. called later and said, oh, I found out I should have referred to the child abuse pediatrician. Right. And so you need to come back for more conversations and testing or whatever. Yeah, that was in California, that case. Yeah, yeah. that was an actual case, mm -hmm. PLA. And it's interesting because I was actually talking to people about that case today. But yes, because that child was discharged from the hospital. Nothing was wrong with the child. Child's discharged. Now the mother gets a call from the pediatrician saying, oh, you know, you need to bring the child back in <laughs> for more testing. Unfortunately, the mother, of course, assumed she should bring the child back in. So she brings the child back in and then they start concocting all these reasons and they end up taking that child from her. There was nothing wrong with the child at all. Yeah. So the mistake, you hate to say it, but the mistake was to go back. 
Right. Not that, not that I'm in any way blaming the parent, because how would she know? She gets a call from her pediatrician and says, hey, you know, they feel like they should run a few more tests, you know, blah, 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 blah. Of course you're going to do that. Right. Uh, so just to be clear, you shared in the book that not every hospital has a child abuse of pediatrician, but you can find out from like, you know, talking to your community and to like Facebook groups or whatever to find out if there, if there is a child abuse pediatrician and how aggressive they tend to be. So there's the, the information is out there that you can learn. Hopefully, about. Hopefully. Yeah. I mean, so for example, if you went into Rady Children's or uh, Massachusetts General and uh, searched in their website for child abuse pediatrician or child protective medicine, you would find out whether, uh, excuse me, I'm just getting over a cold, so that's why I'm coughing every so often. <laughs> um, so you would find out whether they had one on staff, but yeah. the hospitals that don't have them on staff. So for example, a more rural location, like I'm in Maine, um, there is an organization that has a contractual relationship with hospitals. So pretty much every hospital has access one okay. way. So Seattle Children's, they yeah. got one, right? But probably in the middle of, I'm trying to think of a very rural, well, Maine, for example. No Wyoming. Hospital. Somewhere in Wyoming. Probably Wyoming. It probably doesn't have one, but yeah. there, there's an organization with the child abuse pediatrician who will then service these okay. hospitals. So just so to be clear, like, I feel like as the doctor here, I need to say that, like, obviously, if there's an emergency, you should take your child to the emergency room. It's just having an awareness about how to engage in these yes. situations um, so that you're being careful. So I want to move on so we can, because we have a ton of questions from our community. I want to make sure we get to them. Okay. Um, you, but before we get to the, the community questions, uh, you'd mentioned something in an email exchange with us when we were originally inviting you on about okay. a concurrent path of listing that people aren't yes. really aware of on the state yes. child abuse registry. So can you yes. tell us about this? Yes. So when you are accused of child abuse, whether you lose custody of your child, go to court, don't go to court, the general process is that the caseworkers make a decision as to whether you are an abuser or not. And some states it's called an indication, some states it's called a substantiation. That is a decision I'm emphasizing here, made by a caseworker and maybe the caseworker supervisor. There's no judge involved in that at all. And in most states, as a result of that, you are then listed on the statewide registry of child abusers. If you are in fact indicated or substantiated. So you may get a letter that says, we opened an investigation, it's unfounded. Okay, fine. But if you get a letter that says that you were substantiated or you were indicated in that letter, it is going to tell you that if you want to appeal this decision, here's how you do it. And what I say in the book is you have to do what it says in that letter, because if you don't, you are going to remain on that list of child abusers. You cannot help out in classrooms. You can't go to your school's uh, children's concerts. You can't volunteer for scouting, nothing. You are a child abuser. Okay. So you need to appeal it. And a lot of times what happens is that it's simply appealed within the uh, child protection system itself. There isn't even necessarily a court proceeding connected with it, but Here's the incredibly unfair part of this, which is being looked at in Pennsylvania right now, by the way, which is that A, you're put on this list by a caseworker and supervisor. That's it. Mm -hmm. And yet it, it, it has these tremendous ramifications. They'll probably notify your child's school system that you're on the registry of child abusers. And everybody gets that notice. And they're like, oh my goodness, you know, they're a child abuser. Well, you know, some caseworker didn't like you maybe. So they stuck you on the list. Um, 
But even if you lost your child and then ended up in court and won the case and the child comes back, you're still on that registry. It's not a, it's not an automatic, um, you know, expunction just because you win the court case. So that's what I was saying. There's two tracks. Is that clear? Yes. Yeah. Thank you for making sure that that was really clear to us. I feel okay. like, I feel like we need to go back just a little bit because we were talking so much about like the emergency rooms and the, what can happen with the child abuse pediatricians and, um, and how quickly something can happen and, and children can be taken away from you. And then, you know, we acknowledge that there, there could be true emergencies where something yep. needs to happen. So mm -hmm. what could you offer to our community who is having some of this fear that mm -hmm. even before listening to you already afraid of taking their kids to the emergency room from bad experiences, just from even being disregarded, let alone no child, like child abuse of pediatricians. So what could you offer for how to make this challenging decision or any tips on navigating it if they just have to go to the emergency room? Okay. So I do have a number of things in the book and yeah. I don't have it in front of me. So I would suggest taking a look at that. But for example, if your child is injured and you don't know what happened, maybe, you know, you, maybe the child was on a swing in the backyard and you ran in to grab something, you ran back out, the child's on the ground. You don't know what happened. Don't start hypothesizing. Well, the dog next door maybe ran over, knocked him off the swing because then a, well, maybe why, why, why didn't you put a fence around your yard if there was a dog that might run in, you know, they're, they're, they're not looking to exonerate you. Mm -hmm. They're looking for reasons to accuse you. Don't give them reasons. If you genuinely don't know what happened, just say, I really just, I don't know what happened. Mm -hmm. Um, and they love to accuse mothers. So it would be, I have a, I did a TikTok called a guy in the room and that man, or maybe a man in the room, I don't know what I called mm -hmm. it, but anyway, that male presence could be the child's father, could be your father, could be your brother, just someone who is going to be less of a target than you. Yeah. And then what they love to do is they love to split people up. So then they say, oh, you know, I wonder if I could just talk to uh to joe uh without you for a few minutes and then they split joe up from you know jenny and then they're trying to see if they can get two different stories do yeah. not go into these situations thinking well you know i have nothing to hide that, that is like the worst reason to just start talking so be truthful but don't throw out ideas about what maybe happened if you don't know just stick to the truth and if you sense that things are going in an odd direction, then I think you should say, I'm going to, I'm going to need to talk to a lawyer before we keep talking here. And they're not going to like that. Yeah. But I would say that, that it's good advice in medical, medical experiences, regardless to not hypothesize, like, especially with, you know, the, the approach that we take with using homeopathy as our primary method, um, hypothesizing can send us down a path that is not beneficial. Right. Um, and so hypothesizing in general could get your kid on the wrong treatment. Um, it could, could take things on, it was just completely in the wrong direction, or it could create legal challenges for you. So hypothesizing is not to anybody's benefit when getting care for your kid. Um, and one of the things that I just want to throw out there. Um, meditation is a really big part of my life and how I manage a lot of things. And I think that meditation has helped allow for like sitting in discomfort and sitting in quiet. And I think that one of the things that we can do sometimes is if we're feeling uncomfortable and uncomfortable pause, we can just sort of verbal diarrhea and like start yeah. vomiting things out. So yeah. having practice, not like being comfortable in, in uncomfortable situations and being comfortable with silence can be really beneficial. Yeah. And, and a lot of times when they get you in a room with, it usually starts with a social worker. So if a social worker comes in to see you, I would immediately think, okay, maybe we have a problem here because generally they're not coming in when somebody thinks there is no problem. I know they're supposed to be there to be supportive and so forth, but usually starts with a social worker and then a doctor comes in 
they rarely tell you they are a child abuse pediatrician. So I would yeah. probably ask the doctor, you know, what is your name? What is your specialty? And um, understand that if all these people are coming in and asking you questions, there's probably a problem. Mm -hmm. Good advice. And it's okay to say, I don't really understand your question. What what is it you're trying to figure out? You, you don't you don't have to get hostile about it. But when they keep asking you the same question over and over again, you just say, I feel like I already answered this. I mean, he was on the swing. I ran inside. I ran out. He was off the swing. I, I don't know what happened. Yeah. And then they're going to say things like maybe I, I think they might say, you know, well, that injury isn't consistent with the falling off the swing and say, well, I don't know. Yeah. Don't say, oh, really? Well, you know, my older son would sometimes push him off the swing. Maybe right. he push. Don't just don't just don't do that. Don't offer more. Yeah. Don't offer yeah. more. Yeah. Beth, in the section of your book devoted to medically complex children, you give a list of words that could suggest a parent is being considered for medical child abuse. Um, one of those words is homeschool or homebound right. education. Why right. is this a red flag, especially after co or after the pandemic? I don't know, because then they put it in the petition. Yeah. Oh, they claim, oh, um, they're isolating the child. There aren't there aren't enough eyes on this child. Mm. They they and it a homeschooling enough alone wouldn't be enough, but they'll throw it in as a problem. And understand, I don't have a problem with with homeschooling. I'm just telling you yeah. what they do. So yeah. that's what they do. They say, oh, the child was homeschooled. And then sometimes what they do is they put in these petitions, a child is not receiving an education. What? But they <laughs> just put it in anyway. Yeah. Yeah. All right. So Beth, I'm sure you're aware, as we've talked about already a little bit, that our community is largely focused on homeopathy and functional or natural medicine approaches to helping their children. And parents are often concerned about how to walk the line between keeping all medical providers in the loop about what they're doing and not putting themselves at risk for choosing something outside of the conventional model. Can you offer any advice to them from the legal perspective? Well, I would be, one of the things I say in the book is that parents, again, they'll write emails to different doctors and kind of lay everything out in these emails. And it's just never helpful to mm -hmm. do that. Now, I, I know what it's like to be the mother who's in charge of the child's medical care, because I had that. It was also a different period of time. It was, you know, 20 years ago or something. Things weren't as bad as they are now. But I can't tell you how many cases where they'll pull up emails between parents and doctors where the, and I give a specific example. Someone writes and says, oh, it was so terrific to have this meeting with you. And, you know, we've seen five or six different doctors. We saw so-and-so here. We yeah. saw so-and-so there. And then I went there and then I, I took them to the hospital. And, and so when something like that is then presented, it's presented as showing that you are doctor shopping. That's the thing they love to say. So in other words, you're, you're not comfortable with what you're hearing. So therefore you are going to all of these different doctors until somebody tells you what you want to hear. It's not, it's not that you want your child to get well, right? They don't look at it that way. So I don't think I'm really answering your question other than to say that when you coordinate care with different providers, you have to be careful about who those providers are and what their reaction is going to be. And maybe you bring notes, but you don't necessarily start sending a lot of emails to the doctors. I don't know if that works yeah, uh, sure. for you and your practice and so forth. But I'm looking at it like as a lawyer, when I start seeing those, when somebody's accusing a mother of abusing their child medically, and I start seeing all these emails to doctors listing all the different treatments that have been tried, it's just, I know that it's it's going in a bad direction. Yeah. What I'm hearing from you repeatedly is 
listen to your gut. And if something feels off, pull back until something feels more comfortable. And even in those cases where something feels good, that it, um, it's great. Like as a doctor, I love when somebody will express gratitude, um, for the hard work that I've done. And like, you know, we get so many negative emails with like, when there's right. problems that it's great to get a, Hey, I'm feeling so good and, and hopeful about this. Um, just be cautious in how you word those emails or save it for like a conversation. Um, yeah. yeah or do just what you said. I am feeling so grateful and hopeful about this. Thank you so much. Mm -hmm. That's great. Yeah. The details. It's it's all about like the details or where you can get caught up in, in stuff. Yeah. yeah. Um, I think switching into kind of the mom question realm of things. Um, and unfortunately, the first two questions come directly from me because I even just sitting and listening to you guys talk, I could have done like this, like at least 10 times because all of these things I've done, I was the mom that emailed back and forth with providers at big hospitals. And um, I was the mom that took the kid into the ER with the broken leg that did not happen in front of me. And there wasn't an explanation, but I was trying to explain all the things earlier. Mm -hmm. You said something about, um, I'm not trying to scare y'all, but I think that there's a, um, th there's a, there's a, we need to have a healthy amount of awareness in this area because I like you and I, I wasn't quite as, um, you know, quite as long ago, but my girls, their, whenever they were at their worst has been years ago. So all of this stuff, it seems like it's been becoming more and more and more where people are having their kids taken away. Yeah. Um, I was the mom in the hospital or in the ER all the time with a kid, a kid that couldn't eat, a kid that was allergic to literally everything. Um, and one of those times I left the room for one minute to go to the room to get her food. And um, I came back and they wouldn't allow me back in the room. And they told me that someone was interviewing my daughter and that I couldn't go in the room. And then I needed to wait outside because afterwards they were going to come and interview me. Mm -hmm. um, and they started asking me questions that made me very scared. And I was the scared mom that was over explaining everything. And at the time I had no idea what was going on. And it wasn't until a number of years later where I was like, oh my gosh, that's what was happening. It's yeah. literally, and fortunately we had a good doctor at that hospital that showed up shortly after that. And that whole situation got diffused. Mm -hmm. um, this is with my first kiddo. And then my second kiddo comes along and ends up having pans and we're at a pedi pediatrician's appointment. And she's like, you know, this is so interesting. You have another kid with an unexplainable medical condition and nobody can figure out answers and you're having to go to doctor, doctor. And she's like, how are you doing through all of this? Um, like, are, are you doing okay mentally? And I was like, yeah, I'm fine. I'm good. And she's like, you know, it's funny. Has anybody ever mentioned Munchausen by proxy to you? Mm -hmm. And I was like, I, and I was frozen mm -hmm. because that right there, I knew I was in something, but also I didn't know how to handle that particular situation. So for those of us that we are in that moment where we realize that we're being as, uh, assessed for harming our children, is there any language or specific action that we should take or not take in order to protect ourselves, um, not only in that moment, but down the road? Okay. So first of all, Today, you'd be in a lot more trouble than I you know. would because I'm... now these child abuse pediatricians have become very aggressive. They used to say, and I, I, I think it's important to explain to everyone here that medical child abuse and Munchausen by proxy are the exact same things. Yeah. Exactly. Okay. What happened was and I'll tell you very quickly, is that it became a problem for pediatricians to claim that mothers had Munchausen by proxy because pediatricians are not qualified to diagnose adults with anything. So it became a problem. So they decided that what they would do is call it something else. Let's call it medical child abuse 
because now what we're going to do is say it's a diagnosis of the child, not a diagnosis of the adult, but it's just, um, you know, a complete guise, right? Every article they write, it's medical child abuse, parentheses, Munchausen by proxy. They just pull this out when they can. So that's the same thing. When someone starts saying to you, isn't that unusual? You have two children uh, with un uh, conditions that can't be diagnosed. I mean, the alarm bell should go off. I need to get out of here as quickly and safely as possible. So what do you say to that? You say, I know it's been frustrating, but fortunately we have found experts who can help us, but thank you so much for your help. And then you get up and you leave. I mean, really, you do not stick around for that conversation. Yeah. Because you're going to say something when you're trying to defend yourself that is not going to work in your favor. Just to give you an idea of how aggressive they've become, it used to be that they said that these child abuse pediatricians said that, and by the way, they became a, a, a board eligible to be certified in 2009. So not that long ago, right? Mm -hmm. um, 15 years, I guess, right? Ten, no, I don't know. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, so it, it's, it's fairly recent in the world of mm -hmm. medicine. And originally, they said that this is because parents were making up the conditions. Now they say, well, you know, the kids are sick, but the mothers are just saying they're sicker than they are. Okay, so the child has mitochondrial disease. It's just not as bad as the mother says. So it's like this, this gradual attempt to increase a footprint and a power base and the reason I believe that they do this is because it allows them to, so your child abuse pediatrician at Rady Children's Hospital, all of a sudden she's more important than all these really highly qualified specialists because she's gonna decide whether they're doing things correctly or not. So you have a real political thing going on there. So if someone were to start making those kinds of suggestions to you. Gee, have you ever heard of this? You need to realize you're in trouble and leave. You can't leave, you know, just grab your bag and run out. Right. But stay polite, recognize what's going on. Maybe you stop answering questions and you say, oh my gosh, you know what? I have to go, I, I need to go pick up my son. Oh, look at the time. Um, I'm gonna have to go. I don't. I don't know get out. Yeah. Yeah. I would say we probably need to get out, but in a, in like a, as little obvious a way as possible so that there's right. not that, that a report isn't filed because of the way you reacted to what right. was. Exactly. And yeah. maybe if somebody says, have you, have you heard of that? You just say, oh yeah, I've heard of that. Yeah. Fortunately, that's not what's happening here. Yeah. Yeah. What about allegations of medical, uh, medical neglect? How do, as parents, how do we handle that? And how vague should be, we be whenever we're talking about our kids with others? So it's interesting. I, a couple of years ago, because I actually am admitted to practice law in California. My kids were all born there and everything. And I went to a, a seminar and there were some caseworkers there and they were telling me that, that a medical child abuse allegation or a Munchausen by proxy allegation would actually be made under the California statute about medical neglect. And the argument there would be that you are neglecting your child because you're not getting your child the care that the child abuse pediatrician says the child has. It's like the flip side. You're mm -hmm. abusing the child because you're getting the child incorrect care and you're neglecting the child because you're not getting the child the care that they say that child needs. So, uh, you know, you could have like in a panda's case, somebody could have said, 
I'm neglecting my son because he should be in a psychiatric institution and I'm abusing my son because I'm getting him care other than psychiatric drugs. It's like two sides of the same coin. Yeah, it's rough. Um, what, what advice do you have for parents going through a contentious divorce and disagree not only with the ways to treat it, but also its very existence or legitimacy as a diagnosis or when parents accuse them of medical direct in divorce hearings? It's very similar to child protection hearings, except that the parent, the other parent, usually the dad, because the mothers are the abusers, uh, are um, he's usually making the same accusations that are made by child protection service and child abuse pediatricians. So one of the things I think that everybody has to really remember when you're in a courtroom is that Judges do not have any magical um, ability to understand complicated medical conditions. Most of them don't know anything about it at all, right? So, mm -hmm. because why would you? Why would I? I never would have. I didn't have any kind of medical. I happened to have a child who was really sick. And as a result, I had to learn basic medical stuff like the difference between a virus and a bacteria. I didn't even know that. So most judges cannot follow complicated arguments. I try when I'm in a courtroom to make things as simple as possible, as I've done in my books, right? I write in plain English. I don't try to talk legal mumbo jumbo. So when you're in a divorce situation, um, the easiest thing for the judge to do is to just go along with what the dad is saying. Mm -hmm. Dad probably has some kind of a lawyer who's, I mean, lawyer and also maybe a doctor who's backing him up. So you have to have a doctor who's going to back, back you up. And again, it can't be all about what mom is saying. It, it, it really has to be, be when you're in that situation that a medical professional is backing you up. And I try to tell parents, um, you say, well, I'm not a doctor. I don't know. I'm just following the advice that I'm getting. Yeah. Well, Beth, you've been so generous with your, uh, your, information that you've shared. I want to tell everybody, like we, we got a, had a question about medical kidnapping and I'm going to skip it for today because the reality is you've got a lot, like the question is answered in the book with yeah. like detailed explanation for how to, um, how to like keep a paper trail and all of those things. So I'm just going to encourage everybody to get the book. Like I said, you don't necessarily need to read it. I know that it can be really triggering for people who are especially like that this could be their reality, or maybe you've had some experiences, but at the very least get it so you can reference the pages that you need to. It, they're short chapters that are accessible, even if you've got like your brain is fried from all the stuff that you've got going on. So I'm mean, gonna encourage people to get the book to answer that question about how to keep a paper trail should something like this come up. Um, I wanna shift gears just a few very short things. And again, thank you so much for your generosity. Hopefully you've got a few more minutes. Wait, um, I gotta say one thing about medical records. Anybody who has a medically complex child should be collecting records on a regular basis. Yeah. You did okay. make that point very clear in the, in the book. Absolutely. Cause yeah. you won't get them. If there's an allegation of abuse and you're into a whole thing with child protection services and a court system, you can't get the records. They're going to block you from the portal. They're going to block you from the records. So collect yeah. the records like every three months on a regular basis. Yeah. Okay. Go ahead. Sorry. Yeah, and and that's an important thing because, as you said in the book, that um, once somebody is once they once the child, especially if they've been taken from you, they're now a ward of the state, so you're no longer their legal guardian, so you don't have a legal right to have access to those things until right. it's resolved. So, um, but for other details, check out the book um, for sure, and we'll put links in the show notes for how you can get that, so you can go really quickly and easily to get to the books. Um, all right, so. Um, like I said, we want to shift gears to some of the, the questions that moms had to you as a mom. Um, okay. So, so Jody, go ahead and take that away. 
So the first one is going to be just a comment that we wanted to share. And the mom says, this is the first resource that convinced me that my daughter had pandas very beginning of the journey years before homeopathy. My daughter was Sammy. She had similar symptoms. I remember reading out loud to my husband in tears. I emailed Beth and she was so sweet and supported. She, she truly cares. I also know, thanks to Dr. Barr and homeopathy, I'm sorry, I also now thanks to Dr. Barr and homeopathy, feel like we are Sammy at the end of the book about to go out into the world and do great things. Thank you, Beth. And thank you, Dr. Barr. Oh, isn't that nice? That's wonderful. Yes. The the teamwork, it's awesome. I love it. <laughs> okay. Also, um, another mom asked, how did your son's gut turn out after you gave him antibiotics for so long? I mean this sincerely because that's been a strategy for many and it ends up destroying the gut. And then is your son fully recovered now? Okay, so he is fully recovered. And I'm very happy to say it did not destroy his gut. And he was taking probiotics the entire time that he was on the antibiotics. And at the time, recognizing the potential uh, risk there, it really was... I knew what I had on my hands without the antibiotics. So I had to make a decision about which way I was going to go. So mm -hmm. my feeling was I'm not going to, I'm not going to have a functional child if I don't go in this direction. And fortunately for us, it worked out and we would periodically try and reduce the antibiotics. Um, but he just, it wouldn't, it just didn't work you know, the behaviors would come back. So then we'd have to increase the antibiotics again, leave them on for a period of time and then decrease them. Um, mm -hmm. But fortunately, um, he has, knock on wood, not had any negative long-term effects and he's very healthy and happy and recovered. Yeah. Well, we're very, very happy to hear that. And you are very lucky because a lot of kids, is, they they don't come out as um, as well as Sammy did. So um, for the most famous kid with pans and or pandas, uh, we're very happy that things worked out for him the way they did. And we're also happy that we're getting a lot more um, information out into the world thanks to your work, thanks to the work of other moms like Jody um, for coming and sharing their experience, sharing the resources they had and staying in and doing the fight for other people's kids, even when their own kids have recovered. So thank you for your generosity and your time and your expertise with us today. Um, and thank you for the work that you've done for the PANS and PANDAS community over the last many years that you've been doing. Oh, you're welcome. Well, thank you for having me. I hope it helped. I hope, I hope some people learned some things and I hope I didn't scare anybody too badly. I, I don't you think know. you, yeah, yeah. I think, I think that now more than ever, we're in a time where we need to have a little bit of fear. We are those moms. We are those women. This is happening to people with children like ours. And um, had I read this book or your latest book before my girls went all through all of this, I would have been able to better recognize the, the things that I was doing. So it's, I don't think we need to live in fear every single day, but this is a conversation that we need to have. These these things that we're learning are valuable and they will help us stay out of trouble. So again, on behalf of the whole PANS community that all, is always looking for information on this type of stuff, um, thank you for coming and talking to us and sharing your knowledge and not yeah. scaring us, but giving, giving us situational, oh, yeah. Yeah, situational awareness is what I you've given. You need it. That's what I think. I think you yeah. got to know what could happen and how you can potentially avoid it. So yeah. all right, we'll make sure we get links to all of the ways can get in touch with you. Um, okay. if you will make sure if you want to, um, maybe Jody, if we can co coordinate to get, apparently Beth has got a really fantastic TikTok for anybody who's on TikTok. <laughs> so we make sure 85, followers. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so we'll make sure we've got links to all of the ways that you can follow or connect with Beth. If you've got specific questions, um, or anything like that, or need her support for something that your family might be facing. Um, so hopefully everybody leaves here armed with a lot of good information. And again, um, I've said it multiple times already, but get the book because the book is is accessible. And when you're in the moment, you're not going to remember all the things we said, and you're going to be able to get the access to the specific information you need faster than you are going to if you like try to listen to us who talk fast 
on like two times speed to get to the information. So um, thank you, Beth, so much for your time. And thank you. I, I hope I don't have reason to talk to you again in the future, other yeah. than in a professional setting. But um, if you've got any more information that's, that's uh, important for the community to know, we would always be happy to have you back to give us updates on any more um, things that we, we need to make sure our community is aware of. Well, I would be very happy to come back. So if I'm not in the process of terrifying a child abuse pediatrician, I will be <laughs> happy. Fantastic. <laughs> All right. All right. Thank you. Take care, everybody. Bye. We hope you found this episode helpful, hopeful, and inspiring. We try to get a new episode out every week. You can make sure you don't miss any by following us on Spotify or subscribing to our channel on YouTube. If you want to connect with us more, join our Facebook group, Homeopathy for Pans and Pandas, where we have exclusive weekly videos and answer your questions about, you guessed it, Homeopathy for Pans and Pandas throughout the week. If you are already a member, give us a shout out and let us know what you thought about this episode. If you aren't on Facebook and would like to reach us, you can email us at podcast at resiliencenaturopathic.com. Until next time, take care and remember, this won't be forever.